Okay guys, so welcome to week 6 of this review phase where I go over how the most recent week of training went. This form of analysis is super important for all kinds of runners. If you're just getting into running, it's, it's the kind of analysis that you're going to do to make sure that you're not perhaps increasing training too quickly. This is also a great way if you've been a runner for quite a long time and perhaps you want to start keeping track of I'm putting in all this time and effort, are things improving? Are things moving forward? Ultimately what we're looking for in running is to break the body down within the week of training and then to recover enough that the body can break down, absorb the training and hopefully if you're doing it right in a week or two's time things move forward. What a lot of people are doing is they're going out there, they're doing the training but they never really keep track or keep tabs on, is it working? Am I moving forward? When was the last time I did this kind of session? When was the last time I did this kind of session? And that's the kind of thing you need to start to look at. One way you can do that perhaps is to color code your training. And if you're doing speed, it could be red. If you're doing threshold, it could be blue. And then when you're looking maybe in an Excel document or on Strava, you can see, okay, I've done threshold quite a lot lately, but I haven't done much speed stuff, I haven't done much hill stuff, I haven't been doing intervals, and that sort of paints this picture of what am I doing? If you want to go race a 10K, and you get to your 10K, and it doesn't go very well, and then you look back over the previous two months of training, and you realize that you've really only been hitting one intensity, perhaps it's threshold, perhaps it's just intervals, perhaps it's just easy running. It will start to make sense why you're not achieving some of the goals that you likely want to achieve. Running is quite simple. <laughs> it's actually a lot more simple than we make it. It's athletes that make it complicated. Running, you hit the right training, you have all kinds of different levels within your training. You've got your easy, you've got your steady, you've got your threshold, you've got your just a bit above threshold, you've got your harder intervals, VO2 max training, speed. All you have to do is keep working those systems and over time with good recovery, good nutrition, good sleep, all this stuff, over time you'll get better at running most of the time that you're perhaps losing consistency or not improving or not moving forward, it's because you're either rushing some of this training, you're either doing it too fast, which is why maybe you're getting injured, maybe you're doing too much, you pick up injuries, maybe some days you're not running hard enough. And so learning how to execute training, get the right training plan in place, be okay with the fact that you might have to repeat the same session over and over again. I remember in, I think it was like 2013, and one of my really good friends, Andy Vernon, was started being coached by a very good Australian coach called Nick Bedeau. Nick Bedeau sent him this email. Nick Bedeau is a world-renowned coach. He sent multiple, multiple athletes to the Olympics. You might be looking at 20 athletes per Olympics, something like that, amazing statistic. Andy gets this email and it says for the next six weeks, this is what you're going to do. I'm looking at this thinking like, wow, like, cool. And, and that's sometimes how simple this is. I'm on week six. I've repeated the exact same 10 to 12 day cycle for the last six weeks. I literally just sent the coach a text this morning and he said, I, I said, sorry, I said, this might be pretty simple and this might be bloody basic, but it bloody works. My training, my fitness, it's all getting better. So it might seem basic, it might seem simple to just repeat the same patterns, but it works. Where most people are going wrong is they're trying to change the training, they're trying to rush the training, they want to do something sexy, they want to throw in maybe something random like hills at the end of a session or speed at the end of a session. Go to the track, do your session, execute it perfectly, go home, drink your recovery shake, move on. You don't need to throw in these sexy or mad twists thinking you're making the training better when in reality you're probably just increasing the injury risk. 
you're probably going to find that five or six days after the sexy twist that you added to this session, you ended up injured. It, it's that simple. It's easy to track this stuff. Know your limits. Know what you can handle. Do everything you can around the training, recovery stuff, etc., etc. Keep yourself in a good place. Looking at the week, it was a 90 mile week. This was actually a brilliant week. Things are starting to turn a corner. I know I said I wouldn't brag about speeds, and I'm not, but things are starting to look better. I guess I thought about it today. If this is the review for week six, which was last week, and I'm now on week seven, it used to be as a, I guess call it a kid or a 20 year old, 21 year old, I used to be able to, after about eight to 10 weeks of training, maybe I'd been inconsistent, you know, maybe I was sick or I wasn't really training, I'd get back into training, usually around eight to 10 weeks, and I'd be starting to feel good. So I guess the same pattern is happening, and we're gonna get to that. But it was a 90 mile week, it was a bloody good week, good threshold session on Monday, which we'll talk about, on Wednesday, I did some fitness testing. I just uploaded that video all about threshold training. You should check it out. What is a threshold test? How have I got my threshold from six minute mile pace in 2004, light years ago, to 448 per mile pace now? Go check that out, it's a great video, but obviously keep watching this video first because this one's brilliant. Anyway, threshold test was Wednesday. Because Wednesday wasn't supposed to be a threshold test, it was actually supposed to be VO2 max. I did some VO2 max training after the threshold test, and that kind of like, I it was the first time I was going to do VO2 max, and so I was a little bit upset that the first time I'm going to do it in this six weeks, because you, you, you introduce VO2 later on in the program, you don't have to do it straight away. So because it was the first time, I wanted to go do some, but but we'll get to that. Saturday I had another video that I've just uploaded. It was how do you do training the right way. It was one of those really boring and basic days where I just had to keep the lactate low, no other plan, speed didn't matter, and I nailed it. Executed it perfectly, super happy with that. This was a really good week. A really, really good week. I've noticed that things are starting to get better. I've noticed that I've almost started to surprise myself with like paces, you could say. And because I started to surprise myself, this is one of the best piece of pieces of advice that I'll give, I felt that like itch to race, you know? That like, hey, what marathons are coming up in eight to 10 weeks time? Hey, could I do this marathon? Hey, I could qualify for world champs marathon. And I've had to remind myself constantly, we had a plan, and I'm saying we because you're part of this plan. We had a plan and that was to rebuild for the Olympics, for Paris. Every decision that I make is geared towards running 208.10. That's it. I'm not ready to run 208.10 yet, so don't cash in. Throughout my whole running career, and if you're listening, listen up. This is very important. Most runners do this. Throughout my entire running career, I've always cashed in early. I've noticed things starting to go well six, seven weeks into a training block, I've noticed things starting to click, and there I go, I'm ready to cash in. You need to wait. You need to be patient. If things look good after six or seven weeks, imagine how they're gonna look in September at Berlin. Something special could happen in Berlin in September, but not if I'm so willing after seven weeks to start cashing in. Don't cash in, keep saving, keep building the base, keep sticking to the plan, who knows, in 14 weeks, in 20 weeks, maybe the paces that I'm a little bit excited about now, maybe I'll blow them out of the water. And I'll look back and I'll go, Stephen, that was the problem. The problem wasn't that what I try to do with training is I try to front load it. I try to get greedy. I told you guys about that on last week's review. I try to squeeze in more threshold. I try to squeeze in more reps, more time and intensity. What I actually need to do is say, hey, don't try to squeeze more into this week. Let's just do another week. Let's not cash in early. Let's do another week. Let's do another 20 weeks exactly the way we've been doing it. I don't know about you guys, that gives me fear. Whew, it's too easy. The brain loves to complicate things. It wants to make everything all sexy and drama. It just makes a mess of things. So I'm being smart. 
I'm not looking for any marathons. I'm not trying to qualify for world champs. I'm trying to qualify for the Paris Olympics. It's that simple. It's difficult for me to pull the brakes on almost and remind myself of the bigger picture, but races are gonna come soon enough. I'm doing some track 10Ks. I think it's May 6th maybe is a track 10K in America. And then there's also Highgate 10K, that's a brilliant option. There's the European Cup 10K, and then there's some road races, and then I'll race a half marathon in August, and Berlin Marathon in September. So, there's plenty of racing to come. This week, Monday is when I do threshold work. The first half of the session, it's a 12K session, I did three times 2K, then six times a K. The first half of the session is geared towards very low end of threshold. So what you're trying to do is keep the lactates low and get the body used to being basically fully in control, as in like fully, fully in control, but at a decent pace. Trying to get that pace as quick as you can while still being totally in control. And it's the very, very bottom end of threshold. The, as far down as it can get of threshold. It's annoying, it's frustrating, it's boring, you wanna go quicker, you can go quicker, it feels too easy, but it's super important. So I did my three times 2K, I think I went 640, 630, 620 for 2Ks, kept the lactate under two, 1.5, 1.6, 2.0, I probably should have stayed at 1.5, that's the part of the brain going, push it, push it, probably should have stayed at 1.5, but that's okay. Six times 1K, so the plan for the 6 times one k threshold is a range. My threshold range is probably 1.5 to 4. And, and that is kind of the gold standard. Probably more like 1.5 actually to 3, 3.2. 4 is probably like very high end. But we'll say 1.5 to 4. I push the Ks and I push those Ks up in a manner that I'm working the the curve you could say and I call it a curve because that's the threshold curve but I want to work every little bit of it so I, I, I hypothetically want to go 1.5 1.52 1 in the two case then I want to go 2.2 2.4 2.6 2.8 I don't check every one but I gradually turn the screw a little bit up to that effort level that I know that's around four and then I don't go past that and that is my version of hitting that kind of threshold curve I want to expose every little area of it, hoping that the next time I go back to do a session like that, which was actually today, but we don't talk about that yet, I'm hoping that it's all moved on a little bit, all a little bit quicker. You don't want to just work below, you kind of want to work along that spectrum. And that's like, threshold isn't like a pace, it isn't one single heart rate, it's a 160 heart rate, maybe 155 heart rate for me, right up to like 168. It, that, that's a 13 beat range 155 to 160 that's 1.5 to 2 well actually 1.5 160 to 163 that's kind of like 2 163 to 168 that's kind of like 2.5 up to 4 it, it's crazy how it works it's cool though um, but that's in a nutshell Monday the next day a couple of runs Nothing strange or startling, just a very basic day. Couple of runs. Wednesday, this is when I did the threshold test. Because I've just uploaded a full video on that, I'm not gonna go into heaps of detail. But it was supposed to be the VO2 max day, but I was in Belfast, I knew I had the support of the physiologist, and I just wanted to make the most of having the physiologist support. I didn't want to just go to the track and do 15 400s because I didn't even know at that point what should the speed be? What should the effort be? It was my first session doing VO2 max stuff in six weeks. I didn't know. I didn't know what the lactate should be, etc., etc. So I did the fitness test, the threshold test, made use of the lab, and then after the threshold test, so the threshold test was 16 KNR up to 21 KNR. The results were actually good. They weren't my best ever, but they were close. But I've never really done threshold testing really close to some of my best races because often I've been in America or often I've been up at altitude before I go race. So most of my threshold data is kind of like in the base phase of training. It's kind of like a, hey, this is where we're at right now. 
this is where your heart rates are sitting. I call it a fitness test. It's not really a fitness test. It tells you something about your fitness, but it's kind of a zone predictor. It's predicting where, how's your lactate curve looking? Where's your heart rate? Has your heart rate moved? Heart rate can go down for a lot of people, especially as you get a bit older. And so it's worth checking in on that. I like doing it. I don't love doing it at the time, but once it's done, I like to have the data for a future reference point. And it was really good. My numbers were surprisingly low, and I didn't. It now makes sense that they were low because let me tell you, this week's training has really moved in a great direction. And so it now kind of makes sense. Things have shifted nicely. But last week when they looked good, I almost didn't believe it. So when I went to the grass pitches, it was A, to do some VO2 max training, but it was also B, I wanted to see how high I could push the lactate. In my test and on the treadmill, I think my highest lactate was like four, and it was hot and it's sweaty, and, and my, my breathing actually felt pretty bad. And I think that's because I haven't done any VO2 max training. And so if you're finding yourself a little bit out of breath, even at like the thresholdy type efforts, do some VO2 max training. Go to a hill, run up it for 60 seconds, jog back down. Run up for 60 seconds, jog back down. Maybe 10 to 15 of those, pretty hard. Your breathing on your next tempo will be a million times better. I go to the grass, because my numbers were low, I wanted to make sure that my numbers weren't low because I'm like fatigued or tired. One way to do that is to go and push and see how high you can get those numbers. I did my 10 times 60 seconds or 400s and my lactate went to I think 12.8 which is three times what it went on the treadmill and that says you weren't tired, your numbers were just good. It also says you can still do a good job of getting your lactate up quite high. That's a brilliant asset to have. That means you still have that anaerobic capability. It's good to have that anaerobic capability. You don't want your range to be like, there's no point bragging, for example, about four millimoles, not that anybody would, but there's no point bragging about, oh, I only produce four millimoles of lactate, but if you can only get the lactate up to 5.5, <laughs> four millimoles, you're almost at max. And so, of course, because I can probably push it up to 12, I've seen 15 before, I actually seen 17 in a Zwift bike race after I took it after the race. My calf cramped, I think there was so much lactate in it. But if you can push it up quite high, 15, 16, 17, then four all of a sudden is like, that's not that high, because a, a percentage of your max is not that high. If you can only get your max up to five, six, four is, it's getting up there. That was a brilliant day, glad I did the VO2. It's probably no wonder that things are moving on. I'm not gonna encourage loads of VO2 max, but very important. But you only get about, six or eight sessions and after like six or eight sessions you've kind of maximized that and then what you do is you just maintain it it doesn't mean you stop you maintain it so if it takes six or eight weeks of hard vo2 to get your vo2 max to its best place it probably then only takes one session every two weeks to maintain it that's your little bit of advice there the next day, one run, nothing too crazy. Friday was a double run. The next day was super easy actually because I was traveling to Portugal. I did do a YouTube video. That's the session on Saturday that I'm just about to tell you about. I didn't go to Portugal, I went to Turkey. I'm going to Portugal Sunday for an Under Armour event, but I was in Turkey. <laughs> Turkey's amazing, really, really cool. I went to watch European Indoors, which was awesome. Um, going to watch Katie and, and there with my agent Haas and I got to meet up with my coach Tim and speak to him about things and for clarity Tim sets the program but he just talks me through what I should do right Turkey <laughs> uh, Portugal Hawaii Flagstaff Tim hated it I don't blame Tim for hating that I'm a bit all over the place and I'm okay with that but that was difficult for Tim so he prefers that this is what, if I was coaching you, I would set, but you distribute it how you'd see fit. And I do that. But I've literally just finished like my fifth cycle of the, call it the Tim program. But I'm the one that's distributed it. But that's the like context. Friday, couple of runs, 
not easy to do a couple of runs when you've just arrived. Um, that's one of those pieces of advice when I'm like, guys, sometimes you just have to get on with it. Sometimes you just have to go out the door and get it done. I had just had dinner and then I had to go and do a 10K run. I knew it wouldn't be pretty, but I wouldn't have hit 90 miles last week if I didn't go do that 10K. So I just ran on a full belly. <laughs> but that's fine. Better, better to not feel good during the run, but get it done. It'll look better at the end of the week than not at all. It's not perfect. It's not optimal. But it can't always be perfect or optimal. That's not what this review is about. Saturday, oh, I, I need a pat on the back for that. I ran at 6.30 pace to 6.40 for the 2Ks. Um, I don't know what that is per mile, 5.15 to 5.20 maybe. Kept that heart rate sub 160. And then when you get to the end and you take that lactate and it's 1.5, I'm just like, atta boy, well done. I also spoke to Tim quite a lot about that. And I, I kind of almost proved it today in training, but we can't talk about that yet. But I sort of said to him, like, I bet any money how this works is like, you do all this, what seems boring and basic and all the rest of it at 1.5. And it's literally, I'm not joking, you fart and your lactate goes above 1.5. It sucks. It's so annoying. You have to back right off. But I told him. I was like, I bet any money it's that kind of work that one of these weeks you go do a quicker run. You know, maybe you run a 5K. For me right now, instead of running 320 per K, maybe I go and do a 5K at 305 per K. Someone stands at the end, they take your lactate, 1.5. And I was like, I, I already can see it. I already can see that that's where it's going to get to. But it takes time and it takes patience. But you might as well run at 315 to 320 per now for per K for now. Because it takes way less out of the body. It's beautiful. Saturday was brilliant. Loved it. Well done. Sunday, just an easy run. I think I did it quite steady. No, 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 no. Just an easy run. I actually did that with Katie because she had raced her final on Saturday. And that's all in that video, all about the threshold stuff. Katie was fifth in Europe. It was awesome. She's such a little workhorse. That's our birthday today. It's pretty cool. But Katie was great. Very, very proud of her. Um, but yeah, it's our birthday today. So say happy birthday. <laughs> um, but yeah, Sunday was just eight miles. I, I was going to do 12. And then when you're traveling and staying in hotels, my sleep wasn't great. And I mean like... There had just been a couple of late nights, late nights because it's three hours ahead in terms of the time difference. And so I was kind of going to bed at midnight. Sometimes I was editing videos, being naughty. Um, not ideal. I did say I would stop doing that. Uh, in 16 minutes, I have to stop anything YouTube related. That's half eight. But that's my new rule. <laughs> but it was kind of like I seen 12 o'clock as like 9 p.m. because of the three hour time difference. 9 p.m. UK is 12 o'clock midnight in Turkey. But then, like, my days were still starting at 8 a.m., like, to meet Haas for breakfast or go for a run before I went to the stadium. And and I wasn't, so probably those few days in Turkey, I, I wasn't sleeping a lot. And that's where discipline is so, so crucial. You need to stay disciplined. I wasn't disciplined. I was messing around with the YouTube videos. And I, don't get me wrong, I love it. And by the way, the training I'm doing, it's working. That's okay. This YouTube stuff, it's not interfering. It's okay. And that's another piece of advice. Don't beat yourself up about things so much. Don't like, you know, so what? You got like seven, eight hours sleep. There's people probably run 207 for a marathon, 205 for a marathon, East Africans that are in Kenya that aren't getting any sleep. It can be done. So you don't read into those things too much. I'm not saying sleep's not important. Just don't beat yourself up about a couple of tough nights sleep, maybe when you're on holiday or you had a big work project in, don't start hammering yourself. Just cope with it. I literally had a terrible night's night sleep on the Sunday night. Um, and we'll get to that, we'll come back to that. <laughs> per Katie went out because she's allowed to go out as after European Championships to celebrate, but then she wanted to come to my hotel at like three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I was not out because I wanted to train hard the next day. And so long story short, I didn't sleep great that night before, 
and I went to train and just totally open-minded like it's Monday we're gonna talk about it in next week's review but I go to train and totally open-minded like don't worry if you're tired whoop or a ring data told me I'm knackered rest I go do the training amazing it went amazing Katie was delighted because she felt really bad um, but it went amazing and it just shows you so don't like knock yourself don't don't beat yourself up too much I actually literally just had fish and chips a second ago because first of all there's nothing wrong with fish and chips got like chip shop fish and chips amazing my body I, I'm just telling you this advice because sometimes we think quinoa salad salmon rocket lettuce you know I grew up eating fish and chips and burgers and cheeseburgers and pizza and my body responds really well sometimes to like fatty stuff and if I'm craving it I just go for it I'm not like this is not a 10 out of 10 every week because I'm living this monk lifestyle this is 10 out of 10 because I'm still doing this review which means I'm still sticking to the training which means I'm still looking at the training at the end of every week that's already 10 out of 10 what did I do bad this week? Sleep wasn't great because of the you know the time difference. I should have figured that out better. I should have been better with that. And um, Jim, oh my God, guys, <sighs> it's a zero. I didn't go to the gym once. As training ramps up, and I mean mileage, when you get to like 90 and you're doing more sessions and you're doing fitness testing and I let myself down, I've let myself go. I still, I, I haven't even been to the gym this week and we're like, Thursday oh. gym is so important and I need to bloody get back in the gym but once you're out of the routine of it oh it's such a palaver getting back into the gym when you're bouncing around traveling gyms almost the first thing to go because you can't get into different gyms let me just check the time in case it's a 30 minutes okay so Jim, oh, I really, really, really need to get back in the gym. And I will. It's difficult when you fall off the wagon, let's say, and, and you skip a bit of gym, and yeah, it, it, it can end up being a mess. I need to get back in the gym. I will get back in the gym. It's a must. It's so important. Don't follow my bad lead on that. Get in the gym. It is so important. I got the Stride Foot Pod. Not sponsored. Paid for it myself out of my own money. If somebody wants to, you know, buy the running school, <laughs> actually, on the, <laughs> on the running school note, um, God, I haven't even mentioned it until now, somebody bloody stole my bike. I went to a, this is the best part ever. You see my nice new painted walls that I did for YouTube. There's a big investment on my side to try to make YouTube look good. I painted my walls nice and pretty so I could just film at home. But I cycled a and q Forgot my bike lock, cycled home, got my bike lock, cycled back to B&Q, and somebody stole my bike. That bike cost me £1,400. Huh. I'm actually really sad about the bike. I don't care about money at all. I've realised that the more money I make, the more I spend. And so, like, it, money's kind of irrelevant to me. Because if I don't have any, I don't spend it. If I have more, I spend it. So it's irrelevant. And I'm not trying to show off saying anything like that. Please don't misinterpret that. I'm telling you that because I'm telling you having money is useless if you end up just spending it. So money's irrelevant. I wasn't sad that I lost my bike because it cost £1,400. It's actually a more expensive bike, but I got a good deal. I got like discount. I'm sad because I love that bike. For London, it was perfect. It was fast, it was light, it had this seat that used to drop up and down called a dropper post, and it handled the roads way better. London roads are terrible. I'm really sad about that bike. Some, yeah, fucker stole it. So if you want to buy the school and help me out, I'm kidding. <laughs> but yeah, seriously, if you do, that'd be awesome. Um, what did I say about the school? I was going to say something about the school, but I can't remember now. I've completely lost my train of thought. Gym, you want to get back in the gym. Gym's also important. Um, completely lost my train of thought. I've absolutely lost it completely. It was a good week of training. Nutrition, recovery side of things, 
I had physio, I, I totally forgot about my physio appointment, but when I came back, I kind of got lucky, came back from um, training, got a text, you have physio this afternoon, loved it. I've got my body back in a good place with physio type stuff after the car accident in Hawaii, we got that right side of the body moving a bit better. That's probably why you're starting to see some of the paces work a bit better. I've already told you this, you can be fitter than what you're producing I, I, I remembered my train of thought. You can be fitter than what you're currently producing, but if your body's a bit of a mess, you're not showing it. Stride. I'm not sponsored. Paid for myself. 100%. And here's the thing with stride. Stride is very... This is when I was complaining and saying people should buy the school to pay for my stride. Joking. Stride is brilliant because it tracks things like... Um, what I'm really liking is vertical oscillation and stride length and grind reactivity time why Stephen why do you like those things tell us I like those things because I want to know that when I'm doing the gym stuff another there's gonna be loads of reasons why I like this supposedly the East Africans have a longer stride and they spend less time up high as in, I think I'm like seven centimeter or something like that. And I think the average, if you go to Google, I'm a genius. Goodness knows how I find these things. Go to Google, look up the Exeter Sub 2 Physiology Report. And in that has some of the 16 best athletes in the world. I think their times are like 204 to 210, 16 athletes for the marathon. Their average, I think, height off the ground, as in like, you strike the ground, when you're striking the ground, you're trying to move forward. The, the energy that you're putting in, you want it to be moving you forward, not up. Up is useless. So it's kind of up the smallest amount, but the most forward. And then all your energy is pushing you forward. So if you can increase your stride length and you can stop wasting energy going up and down, you know the athletes that are spending more time up in the air than they are on the ground and they're not really getting anywhere. They're kind of like up and down, up and down, up and down, forward. Whew. I'm going to start tracking things like that and keeping an eye when I'm doing gym stuff. Is it helping? Am I moving forward quicker? Am I spending less time up in the air? And am I, is all my energy going into moving Stephen forward? That could really help towards 208 10 massively. So I'm going to look at that. I'm going to look and see if like yoga, mobility, that kind of stuff helps my stride length. I'm also going to look at if I do gym the night before in terms of activation gym, you know my activation routine on joggingroom.com, eh? I'm actually going to look and see if when I do that activation routine, do some of the numbers on stride look better? Maybe the answer is no, but I want to know. The other thing stride's really good for is they have these metrics that kind of tell you if you're tired or not. And so if like a session doesn't go well and you're starting to worry about fitness, Stride does a good little job of, you're bloody gonna buy Stride now, not my school. Stride sucks. It actually does, it's great. <laughs> Stride does this good job of something to do with leg stiffness or springiness, and it can actually sort of show you fatigue. So if you're tired and you're not trained as well, it can track that. I don't know, I, I, I've yet to look at it, but I think they have like a dashboard and maybe they an anal analyze that for you. That would be quite helpful. Possibly I got a free membership because I bought it. They didn't give me one. They, Stride doesn't even know I bought one. They don't even know I'm telling you this. And it sucks anyway. Joggingroom.com, way better. Sign up to the school. <laughs> anyway, Stride, think they have a dashboard. I think I got a free membership. That'd be really cool if they show you little changes over time. But yeah, that's the kind of thing I'm going to start looking at. Mainly because I would like to increase my stride length. I would like to stop jumping up and down so much and I would like to go in a straight line. More energy moving forward, less energy up and down. It's just kind of like more efficient. I think you'll cover more ground quicker because yeah, it makes sense. Anyway, I've done a really good job here. I think I've kind of stuck to like 35 minutes which is really good. Um, that's kind of all I have for you. It was another great week. We're at, we're at week six which is amazing. Um, I'm loving the training. Like uh, the reason I'm fitter is because I'm I'm training more. 
I, I doesn't matter what I'm doing during the day. It gets to five o'clock, half five, and I go get my second run of the day done. Uh, my previous self, I want you to think about this. So my battery died, and that was important. So I'm going to tell you. The way I've been training lately, ever since getting diagnosed with ADHD, I realized that my why for running, why do you run so much? Well, why do you run twice a day every day? Why do you do the gym stuff? Why are you willing to go up a mountain and just run? I realized that I think a lot of that motivation stemmed from the running was clearly helping with the ADHD stuff. No question. I didn't know about ADHD, but it'd be like having hay fever, not knowing about it, but knowing that when you come back from a run, you feel better. Your, your symptoms have cleared up, you know, your your stuff knows, your itchy eyes, gone. When I got diagnosed with ADHD and, and I started my medication, it, it, I didn't need to run. It's like, it's like somebody giving you a hay fever tablet and you're like, great, I don't have to go do eight miles. <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> and so I was probably using running to treat the mental health stuff and, and the ADHD stuff and, and it was doing a great job. Where I'm going with this is, when I'm running now, it's for performance. That's it. I train more because then I'm fitter and I can eventually race faster. I stick to a plan because it's a good plan with performance in mind. I'm no longer needing to run to help the psychology. I'm sure it still plays a role in helping the psychology, but my decisions are being made based on performance. I have medication to help the calm the ADHD stuff down, calm the bouncing around the bedroom unless I go for a run stuff down. I've been lucky that I've got to simply focus on running for performance. Ask yourself why you run. Why are you making decisions? When I'm making bad decisions, I didn't know about ADHD, I wasn't treated for ADHD, I'd finish a marathon like the Commonwealth Games that I didn't train properly for because an ADHD moment after Rotterdam Marathon that I did train much better for, you could say, I had like emotional, yeah, issues. I finished Rotterdam, doesn't go the way I wanted. I'm running 209 pace until 38K. It doesn't quite work. I didn't need to rip everything up and start again. Do you did only change little bits of it and it'll probably work. That's the ADHD stuff. I didn't know about it then. But you go on this spiral of, are your goals, are your ambitions, is what you're, is your planning, is it based on the psychology? As in like, I could do that race, and by thinking about that race, it gives you a massive high dopamine, or is it a good sensible plan? Do you have, we as runners put a lot of brain thought into these races, right? Brain thought's the wrong word. We invest a lot in them, and we give the race the potential to rip our fucking hearts from our chests. Literally. If it doesn't go well, it rips your fucking heart out. So don't ever make plans based on a little high that you get for five minutes. A little dopamine rush pencil in the plan in. Make a plan that says, I have every opportunity at that race of racing well. Do you have enough time? Is it a good time of year for you? Does it fit around your work life? Think about it. Because if it doesn't go well, but yet you never had a chance, let's say you enter a marathon in three weeks time, you never stood a chance, but it will still rip your heart from your chest. Because as humans, we're terrible when it goes bad at thinking about context. Stephen, you never had a chance for that marathon to go well. Why the fuck are you upset? But we're silly. We, we don't think like that. Start to think about when you're making these plans, is it about performance or is it to cure a little dopamine itch that you have at that moment in time? I'm not, I don't want you to read into that too much, but I do want you to start thinking about that. When I'm going for that second run of the day now, it's about performance. I used to hate that second run of the day previously, likely because one run a day was enough to settle ADHD stuff down, excuse my burp, it's my fish and chips. 
But start to think about that. Really start to think about that. Are my decisions, are my plans, are they based on excitement and dopamine? And you need a little bit of excitement, but you have to have a nice balance between I'm excited about that and there's enough time for me to prepare properly because I know I'm gonna throw my heart into this and if it doesn't go well, I'm gonna rip my fucking heart out of my chest. And so do you at the very least have a fair shot at it going well? If you put in the work, if you're doing all the recovery stuff, nutrition stuff, I, I talk about it all the bloody time, but it's important. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Like, subscribe, do all those nice things. If you do, I know I joke about joggingroom.com, but it will transform your running way beyond, you don't understand it. It's very thorough, very, very good. I wouldn't preach it if it wasn't. It'll transform how you even think about a day of training, knowing all this stuff to put around your training. I'm not even going to put the ad thing or anything in. I've, I've said enough about it. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, you're a legend. <laughs> like, subscribe. Take care. Wee! <laughs>